distinguished sitting up here. Um, I'd like, to, first of all, to thank very much Duncan for the invitation uh, to come and speak to you and uh, also a supplier for running this conference. Um, you probably noticed in the, the web um, version I was named as TBC and uh, I was a bit of a late recruit, but it's a delight nonetheless to be here. I, I am in full in the actual program itself. So <clears throat> my talk's about uh, trip iron channels. Thermo trips really sense temperature. So uh, there's been some uh, dispute, doubts in the field about uh, which of the very large number of thermo trip channels actually are responsible in teaching us uh, that that's warm and that's not, for instance. Um, so this was the picture in 2010. <clears throat> there were um, a large number of trip channels. It's a bit confusing. I can see it down there, but not up. And these um, trip channels originated from people who cloned trip channels and expressed them in hex cells, tested the hex cells with a, a, an elevated temperature or a decreased temperature and said, hey, it responds. So they discovered channels ranging from trip V2 at the extreme hot end down to trip A1 at the extreme cold end. And this seemed very satisfying because these channels spanned the entire con continuum. And of course, that's how we, we sense temperature. Except it's not, because when global knockouts were created in real animals, however, many of these so-called thermotrip channels were found not to contribute to thermal sensation at all. And I've got a little uh, sort of knockout here. It's a bit like a, a firing range at a fair. You're dead. And these ones all went down, leaving only trip V1. And it was already clear that trip V1 was not the only channel that uh, sensed a painfully hot temperature, and also trip M8, which sense, senses moderate coolness. So how can we fill the gaps in here, down here, etc.? So how do we really sense temperature? Well, <coughs> many DRG neurons respond to known trip agonists. So you can see this by calcium imaging. But some th neurons respond to temperature, but don't respond to any of the obvious thermotrip agonists. So how can we sort this out? So uh, with Jackson Tan, uh, now about 10 years ago, uh, we set off to have a look at this. So this is calcium imaging and sensory neurons at rest. You all know this technique. You apply a trip agonist, trip V1 agonist, and, well, I've just indicated a couple of the uh, neurons that respond. Uh, there are, of course, many others. So these are trip V1 expressors. When you apply a trip M3 uh, agonist, which had also been thought to be a, a temperature sensor from work mostly in Tom Voetz's lab, uh, you see a different group of neurons which respond. Some of them overlap with trip V1. Some of them are completely different. But when you apply a, a warm or a hot temperature, it activates all of the ones that we saw up here, showing that these uh, ion channels really are temperature sensors, but it also activates some other ones. So these ones I've pointed to here are novel in that they didn't respond here and didn't respond there, etc. So we use this technique uh, to find out more about what sort of neurons these were. And the most obvious thing is we can zoom in with a patch clamp pipette and measure the current voltage relationship in response to an elevated temperature. And we got this remarkably linear current voltage relationship. And the fact that it crosses uh, the axis at pretty well precisely zero is characteristic of a trip channel. So we're on the right track a bit here. But there are a depressingly large number of trip channels to choose from and which uh, one is it from those? Well, uh, Jackson and I set out to discover this. Well, first of all, a linear IV relationship uh, is consistent with trip M2, but also with a number of others, but at least it narrowed the field somewhat. And then we applied an RNA sequencing uh, strategy to confirm that the novel heat-sensitive channel is indeed trip M2. So we felt that fairly sure that we were onto something here, but the conclusive evidence, I'm sorry, I had another thing here, here we go. 
Uh, the conclusive evidence came uh, when we got uh, trip m 2 knockout mice and we looked at their thermal sensation. Now, I'll just go over how this graph was created because there's quite a number of other experiments coming up using this. Uh, you put the mice onto two platforms. Uh, one is at 33 degrees, which is the preferred temperature for mice. They like it the best. Uh, the other one can be either at an elevated temperature or a decreased temperature. And you just find out how much time the mice spend in one or the other. They normally zip around a bit and test them both and then find their favourites. And <laughs> you can see here that they avoid cooler temperatures here. They prefer 33 degrees. But the striking difference between the knockout and the wild type comes in the range of warm temperatures, where these mice very much avoid a temperature of 38 degrees centigrade. When you remove TRIP-M2, uh, they're really pretty neutral. They don't care. So really, this experiment is pretty conclusive in showing that TRIP-M2 is the sensor for warmth. It doesn't have much effect in the cooler range, uh, nor in the hot range up here. So wild-type mice avoid 38 degrees. TRIP-M2 mice don't sense 38, so TRIP-M2 is the sensor for noxious warmth. So uh, I've knocked out a lot of those TRIP channels that were there, and I'd just like to return to this little picture here and bring it up to date a bit. We now have TRIP-M2. This was published in Nature about uh, seven or eight years ago now. We have TRIP-M2 in the middle. We've still got TRIP-V1. We've still got TRIP-M8. But TRIP-A1, I put that out here, but um, an agonist for TRIP-M8 is uh, mustard or wasabi. I remember the time I went to Japan for the first time and I, I got this enchanting little uh, black tray with all sorts of delicious looking things on it. So I thought, ooh, where shall I start? So I just saw this little green pyramid sitting at the top right. So I thought, let me try that. So I put it in my mouth and Jesus Christ, it was, <laughs> it was like an atomic bomb had gone off inside my head. That's wasabi for you. So somehow the sensations that I felt at that time were of heat rather than cold. So the idea that uh, trip A1 uh, is down at the cold end just intuitively feels a little bit incongruous. And work from Tom Voet's lab has shown that, sorry, that uh, TRIP M3 is also a heat sensor. This was work some time ago. And more recently, they've shown, shown that TRIP A1 uh, belongs up there. I'm sorry, I just missed out one thing, which is that if you're dealing with the um, sort of non-noxious range of temperature, which is really between 20 and 40, uh, then the balance between these two inputs here creates a preferred temperature of about 32 degrees. So I want to move on now to sex difference because everyone, including ourselves, uses male mice. We're extremely sexist, I'm afraid. Um, but when we looked at females, we found that they responded completely differently. And the question is, why is this? So once again, we're doing the same experiment here. Uh, this plate is at 33 degrees, and this one's at 38 degrees. So we're comparing these two because we know that trip M2 is very important for this temperature range. And you can see that the males spend almost 80% of their time on the 33 degrees plate. Uh, and if you sw switch the plates around, just to make sure that there's no sort of cues in the room, sort of a looming figure or something like that that they might be avoiding, uh, then they zip back to the other plate pretty quickly. So that's males, but females are completely different. Actually, females prefer 38 degrees to 33 degrees, and this is very common. So male mice prefer cool temperatures, females prefer warmth, and the same is true in humans. So many experiments with humans have shown that women prefer uh, warmer temperatures than men. Uh, this is familiar to most married couples who traditionally fight over the duvet with the, the men throwing it off and the women trying to, to gather it up. So women have been said for a long time to have cold hand, warm heart. I, I didn't know this at all, but I, I was talking, probably about 15 years ago, I was talking with a, a charming woman scientist and, and she said, oh, women always have colder hands than men. And I said, do they? And she said, yes, and she laid hers on top of mine like that. 
Uh, and it was, indeed, it was a lot cooler. It made my heart beat faster as well, but there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so what drives this? Well, the obvious thing is testosterone, uh, but, uh, which men have and women have much less of, although they don't have a complete absence. Uh, testosterone, we found, is important. Here we have a, a, a series of these are all many, many mice here that, that make up these averages. Uh, they are about 80% preferring uh, 33 degrees over 38. And if you remove their testosterone, this is by uh, injection of a, a clinically used compound, which just prevents the production of testosterone, uh, you find that they go down towards the female level because the, the female level is, is down a bit below the equality point here because they slightly prefer 38 degrees. And <laughs> in females, if you inject testosterone, the opposite happens. They move towards, but not identically to, uh, the male position. So uh, testosterone is certainly import an important driver of this difference. We looked at female hormones. This is the obvious thing to do. Uh, they didn't have any effect at all. Uh, and it's clear the effect of testosterone is not total. So removing testosterone doesn't may mean the male mice go down to the female level, which would be down here. Uh, but it's certainly a large part of the story. So chemical castration causes a shift in male thermal, thermal preference towards female, and testosterone in females causes the reverse. So um, our explanation of this is that TRIP-M8, just looking at the solid lines here, uh, TRIP-M8, uh, a curve which goes from full activation down to zero, uh, over the space of about 10 degrees or so, 10 or 15 degrees, um, fits the male data pretty well. So that's TRIPM8, uh, the cool receptor. I won't call it the cold receptor. It's sometimes called the cold receptor, but I think of coolness as being a pleasant sensation, whereas cold uh, is an aversive sensation, painful cold. So TRIPM8 is the cool receptor, and TRIPM2, uh, which is activated by uh, mild, elevated temperatures is the warm sensor. And these two cross over at about 33 degrees, 32, 33 degrees in males, uh, and this is the equilibrium preferred temperature for males. Now, if you just shift these curves a bit, like this, trip M8 moves a bit in the positive direction, and trip M2 moves rather further towards, and, and this curve here, the solid curve, is the pain sensor, which, uh, with, with the work from the Wurtz group, we would attribute to a combination of TRIP B1, uh, TRIP M8, uh, sorry, sorry, TRIP M3, and uh, TRIP A1. <clears throat> so why we have so many uh, thermal pain sensors is not entirely clear, but perhaps it's just a very important sensation that we shouldn't burn ourselves. And what happens in the females is that these shift in the positive direction. This, the TRIP M8 moves from here to here, TRIP M2 moves from here to here, and the preferred temperature for females is therefore shifted by several degrees from a cool temperature of 32, 33 to a warm temperature of 37, 38. So I've just got one of my cute little diagrams here uh, showing this for females. So in females, trip M2 is shifted in the positive direction and trip M8 is also shifted in the positive direction and the preferred temperature is about 36 degrees. Well, I, I think I've got a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to wrap up with a, a different story that was work carried out in my lab, predominantly by Tamara Bose, who's now uh, moved to Holland. And this was how we detect noxious cold. So just going back, if I may, uh, you'll see we've filled up, up this area pretty well, but there's a huge gap down here the temperatures below 20 degrees down to 15, 10, 5, etc. cetera, uh, ice temperatures. Uh, this is certainly painful cold, and we don't have the first idea how we detect it, except that it's certainly not trip A1, as was originally proposed. So we looked again at our calcium imaging of neurons, and we see here uh, a, a neuron which, uh, this one just down here, uh, when you apply menthol, which is an active activator of TRIP-M8, 
you get a big increase of calcium concentration, which shows that this neuron expresses trip M8. And when you go very cold, we went down to six degrees, which is certainly a painful cold temperature, uh, you also activate the neuron. That doesn't mean to say that trip M8 responds to, to six degrees, because of course, in order to get there from 33 degrees, you need to pass through a whole range of cooler temperatures uh, before you arrive at the ultimate temperature that you get to. But this, just, this is just how we would detect a trip M8 expressing neuron, while this one here, there's a neuron in here, although you can't see it, and it's certainly responding to extreme cold, as we see down here. Now, the difference in, so some DRG neurons respond to cold, but not to activators of trip M8, trip A1, or trip C5, which was another one that was implicated for a while, but has now disappeared along with so many of the others. So these neurons, as I mentioned before, are activated in completely different temperature ranges. Uh, the trip M8 positive neurons are activated mainly in the temperature range above 20 degrees up here, whereas these other neurons down here are activated mainly at the extreme cold temperatures of between 8 and 15 degrees. So trip M8 neurons have a mean threshold of 23 degrees, whereas the novel, as we call it novel because we didn't know what was causing this at all, uh, cold sensitive neurons have a mean threshold at about 15 degrees, mean that is, but with many below that as well. So what's going on here? Well, we uh, tried various blockers. You can buy a lot of blockers these days from the, the chemical companies. As somebody pointed out to me, they're all failed drugs, which they try to get some money back on by selling them to poor scientists such as ourselves. And we use this one YM plus a bunch of numbers. And uh, this is a blocker of ORI channels. Uh, for those who don't know what ORI is, I will explain in just a moment. And you can see that's blocked completely the cold response. So there's a cold response, there's the increase in calcium completely blocked by this YM compound. Nobody's going to believe this, nobody believes in pharmacology and quite rightly too, uh, <clears throat> but we have a number of other approaches. But certainly I just, just wanted to introduce ORI and STIM channels because they prove to be very important. So these channels uh, the ori is uh, in the surface membrane, as we see here, and STIM1 senses it. There it is down here, these little, little spiders sitting on the endoplasmic reticulum. <coughs> they sense calcium levels in the endoplasmic reticulum. And when the endoplasmic reticulum re discharges it cal its calcium, as it needs to do in a number of cases, muscle contraction, but also secretion, etc. Many, many functions require discharge of these uh, calcium stores. Um, then depletion of the calcium, the calcium's gone here now, as you can see. Wonderful what you can do with electron microscopes these days, these high definition pictures that you get. Um, and, and depletion of the ER calcium causes STIM1 to translocate towards membrane facing sites where it locks onto the ori channels, they sort of form this complex together, and here you can see down the bottom, uh, you can see that the calcium enters, and of course the function of this is that it is now pumped into the ER and refills the ER and allows the cell to do another cycle of whatever it is that it wants to do. So there are three ORI isoforms and two STIM isoforms, so Tamara went through all of them in different combinations, and you can see there's the cold, this is in the hex cells that I referred to rather contemptuously before. Uh, you can see that only one combination, STIM1 and ORI1, produces a response to cold. There's the cold stimulus down the bottom here. So STIM1 STIM and ORI1 are the responsible isoforms, but as I said before, nobody believes hex cells. So we did a much more difficult experiment in real neurons where we transfected in siRNA that would downregulate STIM1. And we marked, it's very difficult to do this in neurons, they don't like being transfected, uh, but we marked the cells which had been transfected by co-expressing M cherry. So you see that neuron's a hit. These other neurons which are up here uh, are not. And you can see in response to a cold stimulus, a number of neurons respond, as we see here, but certainly this one does not. 
Well, you're not at all going to believe a single uh, neuron like that, but it works very well on average. Uh, this shows the amount of the response here, which is large in, in, in non-transfected cells in the same uh, preparation uh, and is much smaller in uh, cells which have been successfully transfected, as we see here. And also the percent of respondents is, is very different as well. So suppressing STIM1 with siRNA abolishes cold sensitivity in real neurons. So uh, just to summarise, which was actually a very long story, but just to give you the main points, uh, STIM1 in the endoplasmic reticulum is activated by cold, but without discharge of the, cal the calcium stores in the endoplasmic reticulum. So this is, brings in another function of STIM1. Not only is it a calcium sensor, it's also independently a cold sensor. So we showed that the stores were not discharged in order to produce this response. And ORI1 channels in the plasma, plasma membrane bind to STIM1 and calcium enters the neuron. Um, well, this has kind of been a bit data light, but I thought I'd give you the general idea. And uh, most of this is available in the press. Uh, we published this story of Tamara's actually just a, a couple of months ago. So particularly to thank uh, Chun Xiang Tan, who very kindly allowed us to call him Jackson instead of his proper name, <coughs> Bruno Villa and Tamara Bowes, and also to thank our funders and sponsors. Thank you very much. Very, very nice work. Thank, Thank you. You. Um, you mentioned the, uh, the involvement of the uh, ORI and STEAM in the uh, temperature sensing. Is this some, precisely because of that, is it something known about the mitochondrial dynamics that are involved in the temperature sensing, uh, you know, because of the coupling between these channels and the my mitochondrial uh, dynamics? Um. Is STEM1 expressed in mitochondria? I no. thought not. No, no. The, the question is that, you know, as soon as you, uh, you mobilize, you recruit the, 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 the ORI channels, then something is happening also in mitochondria and, uh, you know, with the coupling of the calcium signal. So something is known about the calcium signal and mitochondrial dynamics in temperature sensing? Not at all, as far as I know. No, I'm sorry. Um, I mean, this story about ORI and STIM being involved in cold sensation was completely novel, and we only published it a couple of months ago, so there really hasn't been any other work on this that I know of. Sorry. Thank you. There's um, really elegant work. Thank um, you. I've been interested in the testosterone effect, and do you know how long it takes? Because many years ago, we showed that there was a non-genomic effect of testosterone that actually uh, went through a calcium signaling. So how fast does your testosterone effect take? Um, yes, I, I, I think I'm familiar with that work, but it, it's slow. Um, so we, we actually measured testosterone as a function of time after a, an injection of digaralix. And within three to four days, testosterone plummets to a low level, to an undetectable level, actually and remains low. A single injection of the Galax is enough to keep testosterone down for at least two months. And eventually it recovers and, and so does the thermal sensation. Um, but the uh, change in thermal preference is delayed by at least a week. So what does that mean? Does that mean it's genomic? Uh, it's certainly not a quick effect. I would guess that a genomic effect is more likely, but how this works, we absolutely do not know. Uh, going back to the STEM ORI uh, experiments that you showed, do you have any sense why you don't get mobilization of calcium from the stores with this interaction between STEM1 and ORI1? 
Well, why, why should you? You, you <laughs> speak as though mobilisation of calcium is the important event that starts everything off. But we've looked very carefully and we can't see any calcium mobilisation at all. Uh, you can do this very easily, just image neurons, uh, uh, block the ORI channels and look to see whether there's an increase in internal calcium, but there's not. Yeah. Um, so my guess would be that this is a completely independent and undiscovered function of, of STIM1. I, 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 I think uh, perhaps I, I haven't referred to this, but a, 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 a sort of more interesting question is that this release of calcium uh, or the influx of calcium through ORI channels doesn't cause any depolarization because these are highly selective calcium channels. So we're talking about a local effect because there's no depolarization which can cause action potentials to be propagated up to the central nervous system. So is this really a sensory system? I think the answer is it could be a sensory system on a local level, but it's not a system that gives a sensation of cold. Um, so our best guess, unsupported by evidence, but hey, we're allowed to think, aren't we, uh, is that uh, it controls the, the release of uh, uh, autonomic transmitters, such as noradrenaline, which causes vasoconstriction in response to cold, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but that's just a guess. And just a, a short question. I wonder what is the temperature range at which this STIM1 activation starts to activate? Uh, very cold, very cold. Uh, 10 to 15 degrees. So do you, why won't everyone, everyone neurons sense such a cold temperature? If you've got frostbite, then yes. <laughs> yes. There, there, are, there are two phases of, of response of the vasculature to, to cold temperature. Uh, as the temperature lowers, uh, the uh, uh, blood supply to the a lot of people here like, would know a lot more than I do about this, but uh, as the temperature drops, the blood supply to the uh, peripheral skin is restricted in order to conserve the heat. But then you have the problem that things like ears or toes or whatever uh, could uh, be deprived of oxygen because the blood is not going to them, uh, which is called frostbite, of course. So we're talking here about catastrophic damage. Um, so it's been well known for a number of years that the, the, the uh, blood flow goes down and as the temperature drops further, uh, it goes up again. And you can see this on bright, cold, frosty mornings where people's ears are red instead of being white. Uh, so this uh, cold-induced cold vasodilation, CIVD is what it's called, but this phenomenon's been known for many, many years. <laughs> Golly, was that a dog? <laughs> 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 um, but, but it's not. <laughs> but the the molecular basis has not been understood, and I think I think we now understand what the molecular basis is likely to be. One last quick question for you. Uh, so stim one's expressed in a lot of other cells as well. So do you think it performs a similar sort of function in in other cells? Again, you you put your finger on a, a very difficult problem. Yes. We can express STIM1 and ORI1 in hex cells, and it, uh, they produce this uh, cold increase perfectly well. But STIM1 and ORI1 are ubiquitous. As far as I know, they are present in every cell of the body. And certainly, we wouldn't want to have this reaction in all cells of the body. Um, so how it's controlled, how it's localized, uh, we were able to recapitulate it just by expressing the commonest isoforms. So it's not an isoform-dependent thing or a sort of a mutation-dependent thing. So, yeah, good question, but to which I don't know the answer. Okay, okay. thank you, Peter, thank for you. a great talk and a great start. Thank you.